welcome everyone and welcome to our panelists so uh, we are starting the session on uh, cyber security and uh, i would like uh, you know uh, our panelists to give a brief intro uh, about themselves and their work check well, my name is josie george uh, i'm from wipro technologies i lead the emerging uh, tech practice for cyber security uh, and what emerging tech for us is uh, uh, secure AI, the, the earlier question on AI threats and stuff like that, uh, 5G security and uh, quantum security, these are the areas that we sort of focus on. I also uh, uh, helped put together an uh, annual report from the we've been doing it since 2017, uh, called the State of Cyber Security Report. Uh, it's usually, uh, it's a large publication, about 80, 90 pages, uh, we just did one the late uh, 2023, uh, it's available on the website. Uh, and covers uh, you know, significant aspects, one of the most read uh, reports from this part of the world, and covers aspects on attacks, defense, and also patent filings across uh, the world in cybersecurity. Uh, that's me. Hi guys, uh, I'm Nihar, Nihar Patare. Uh, I'm the tech CEO and the CISO at 63 Moons, and also heading a new strategic business unit in cybersecurity, which we launched on 1st of December. Uh, a very unique proposition that we bring to the market. As we go on, we would discuss on the same. Uh, being in this industry for the last 26 years, uh, with 63 moons for the last 15 years, uh, protecting our exchanges, our softwares that we have built across, and prior to that, worked with Bosch for nine years here in Bangalore. All right. So I begin with my question. Uh, we know, you know, the companies are exposed to the cyber threats and all. Uh, so, what can be done to, uh, you know, mitigate those risks, security risk? Well, this is an age-old question. Uh, this is the same question which was asked 10 years back, and the same question which will be asked another 10 years later. And uh, I feel, uh, keeping up with the times, uh, this is always going to be a cat and mouse uh, thing. How the evolving technology? Uh, as technology evolves, uh, 5G evolved and I have been talking on this for the last two or three years before 5G came in. It is not only the, the speed of your Netflix or your YouTube videos which is going to uh, speed up, but it is also going to help hackers or spammers access your mobile phones or your company data at a much quicker rate. The data transfer rates that we were used to 10-15 years uh, back are getting faster and faster. The hacks are getting uh, smarter. To uh, answer your question, uh, we need to evolve with the times and if you do not evolve, the threat is real. Uh, everyone will be affected. We were running a lot of exchanges like MCX, uh, India's first energy exchange, Dubai Gold Commodity Exchange, Singapore Mercantile Exchange. We were faced with millions of state-based attacks and we defended uh, this with the best and the latest of technology. The only way to uh, fend off is to be updated. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll take it from uh, a broader enterprise context, right? I mean, and if you, uh, I'll start with the quote. Uh, this is from, it's actually wrongly attributed to uh, John Chavers and uh, Robert Mueller, who, who was the FBI director a few years back. And it, says, it goes as, you know, there are two types of co companies, uh, ones that have been hacked and the ones that will be, right? Uh, and it, it sort of sets a problem context in terms of, uh, where we are with cyber risk and how uh, the world is perceiving it, right? It is, uh, it is one, uh, if you look at cyber PD a couple of decades back, people were focused on how do I protect my infrastructure, network, and prevent people from you know, breaking in through the firewall. That was just the focus. Today, uh, nobody is spared. I mean, uh, nobody can stand up and say, I'm 100% secure and you know, nobody's going to break in and things like that. It, it is a, a nuisance that is sort of spread across the globe. Uh, and so if you look at the essence of what needs to be done, it starts from identification of risk. And that risk itself is such an uh, evolving sort of uh, uh, area. You know, if you look at it from the way business is done. I mean, you, if you look at attack surfaces in, in, in the cybersecurity context, earlier it used to be just stuff that is on your data center. You know, you know I, IP address based servers and stuff like that. It's evolved to cloud, it evolved to IoT sensors that could be deployed in different environments. And today, AI itself has become a potential attack surface. Uh, your connected cars are attack surface. Uh, uh, 
a, a nursing syringe that is used automated uh, in, in a nursing station uh, or in a, an ICU bed which has an IP address, that's potentially an attack surface because you could have ransomware that could just wipe through that. So identification of risk is one, uh, then doing what you have to do to protect uh, those uh, assets from the, those risks uh, is important. But today, you can't live only with protection. You have to assume that at some point in time, the walls that you build around the palace will, will get penetrated, somebody will break in, and uh, uh, you will have to face the consequences of that. So, so detection becomes uh, equally important. And that's why most of regulations around the world are focused so much on how soon will you report to a regulator that you're being breached. Because, which means that you're forced to put the money and investments in to make sure that you're monitoring your environments, and as soon as you detect a breach, you, you, you act on it, and then you let the uh, regulators know, and, and all of your stakeholders go. But detection is also not enough. You have to, today, assume that you will get breached, going back to the code that I started with. And so you have to recover from that. And so it's, it's all boils down to cyber resilience. You have to assume that at some point, whatever infrastructure that you're running with will get breached, and you will be able to recover very quickly and limit the damage that is caused. So, for example, if there's an intruder inside your environment, what you want to do is be able to reduce the window of opportunity that somebody has to inflict damage inside your environment. So, it is identification, protection, detection, and eventually, uh, you know, recovery and response. Thanks, Josie. How oh, wonderfully answered. Uh, another area is about the regulatory uh, aspect, you know. Uh, so, what's your take on the regulatory requirement? Uh, regard to cyber security and financial crime. Yeah. Yeah, so on, on regulations, I mean, we work with a lot of our customers uh, who have um, a global footprint. So if you're operating in 40, 50, 60 different countries, um, the way governments will look at regulating their, uh, the ecosystem from a cyber security standpoint, uh, and risk mindset will, will vary from context to context. And if you look at it in the Middle East, if you look at India, if you look at what happened, what's happening in Europe, uh, there are nuances that are very, very different. But, and so, for somebody who's dealing with regulatory compliance, I think the, the biggest challenge is, you know, how do I meet all of those broader requirements that are sometimes conflicting in nature as well, or seem to be conflicting in nature, um, and yet, uh, do what is right for the organization. I think the, the, the way I look at it is you have to look at the principles behind regulations first. Uh, and uh, I think that always is a good place to start because uh, the underlying principles are meant for the greater good of uh, you know, the economy that you operate in, the stakeholders, including consumers and stuff like that. And so take, for example, privacy. There are some underlying privacy principles that have been floating around for a long time. And, uh, uh, the, it, it you know, points to how you collect data, for what purpose you do it, how do you store it, and when you're done using it, you know, uh, how, how do you store it securely, and how do you transfer it securely, and once you're done using it for the right purposes, do you need to hold on to it or do you destroy that, right? So that life cycle itself is, a, is an underlying principle to why there are uh, certain types of obligations and uh, uh, asks from uh, data uh, owners and uh, producers uh, in, in the market. So. If, when you're looking at a broad spectrum of regulatory compliance requirements, I think the starting with the underlying principles makes is a good place, uh, and that lets you uh, st lets you start on a, a solid foundation. Of course, you have to deal with some of those uh, outliers. If you are a door bell curve, that will you know ask for some requirements here and there, uh, and that is a matter of legal perception as well as you know uh, how technically you can implement those controls. But uh, uh, those are minor variations. But overall, the principles fundamentally will. will well, uh, the regulators are catching up. We finally have the long-awaited uh, Privacy Act that we have been waiting for. And uh, this is going to change. The, the implementation date will be in a few months from now. And this is going to change the way data is collected, stored, and passed on for all of us. We are all, uh, as a consumer, uh, people are going to see a drastic change. Uh, we will be signing a lot of consents where the data is going to be given right from the people collecting your data in malls, to customers, uh, to underlying contracts that we are now having with customers and our principals, how our personal uh, information is going to be shared across uh, in this country. Uh, regulations, 
we are very well regulated in uh, in terms of law. I, I am pursuing law myself, and I see a stark difference between why the Digital Information Technology Act came in late and how. Uh, because uh, although we are an IT-based uh, nation, yeah, we have one of the best software companies. We provide manpower across the world, and we follow it whenever there is uh, uh, rules across for those nations. We are very stringent in following that. When when it comes to us, we become a little relaxed. Yeah, the same one, same uh, example. I would say that if you are driving in Dubai or Germany and US, you follow all the rules. But once you come back to Bangalore or Mumbai, you feel relaxed. Yeah, because the law, the hand of the law is not so stringent uh, to catch up on us. Uh, regulation wise, uh, also we have a very powerful circuit. They are catching up now. We have to uh, report a cyber crime or a attack. In 60 minutes is the max time that you have to report uh, from an incident which has uh, happened. But being us, uh, uh, many of the cyber crimes are not getting reported. People do not like uh, getting reported. They don't want the company image saying that and they try to hush it up. They do not understand the uh, uh, larger picture, how certain would help you into that. So regulation is gearing up and I think in the next uh, few years, it's going to be very stringent. Uh, operating here. If I may just add on, I think on regulations, especially in, in the context of startups, which is a, a big burden for a lot of uh, startup organizations, I think um, depending on the business plan and uh, uh, you know the strategy that you're employing, I think to start with, the, and I'm moving back to the principle part of it, right? think global if, you, if that's, that is the direction that you have in terms of expansion, but act local because you, you only have that much resources to sort of uh, build that uh, 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 compliance capabilities. But, uh, but if you think global and apply the principles that are globally accepted, uh, your ability to sort of scale then becomes uh, a lot more easier. So that's Okay. Uh, if we talk about the investments, uh, what kind or what sort of investments are needed in cyber security space? And do you think the businesses are ready to make that investment? Yeah, I mean, in, in the current economy, I mean, if I, I, I if I go back to, if I may quote from the uh, report that I was involved with, uh, we've been tracking cybersecurity budgets uh, over the last uh, seven years, and uh, uh, I mean, give and take uh, across the globe, it varies from four to uh, you know, fifteen percent, depending on the sector that you're talking about as well. So, of the IT budget that is allocated for cybersecurity, um, and so that is one point to keep in mind. So you have a, a certain uh, portion of the pie that you will get from what the organization is going to give you. Now, when it comes to uh, the, the way in which the budget is utilized, I think one of the things that we have seen across the industry is uh, there is a overload of tools available that people are using across the board for securing the stack, starting from the network all the way upwards. And today, in today's economy, if you see the struggle that many of the uh, you know security organizations are going through, there is a cost optimization drive. Um, so uh, you have to sort of deal with those pressures as well. So when it comes back to budgeting and things like that, um, there is tremendous opportunity. But I think um, for for startups, you have to look for unique problems that you can solve. Uh, and from an enterprise standpoint, uh, I think the 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 method would be to as much as possible. Uh, platformize and rationalize um, uh, the technologies that they use so that the, the, they have a bet, better strategy to sort of address this risk there. Making investment in this space? They are now post COVID. Yeah? Okay. COVID changed a lot of things. Into security, everyone work, uh, went back uh, home. Uh, everything was online. Businesses that never thought they would get online became online. Even universities, which never thought like Harvard, that they could ever go online, they also went online. So with this, uh, what has happened is, I, I tell in most of my uh, sessions, uh, what happened in COVID, uh, a lot of people lost their jobs. With this losing of jobs, many people, the youth, took the internet to learn how to hack. It was very difficult for people to uh, do get into the hacking space 10, 15 years back, you really need to be a skilled hacker. Now you just download tools, you see some videos, and you can, out of 20, you get one hit. Once you get it, it's very easy money. And that's how the hacking space changed. 
post covid india saw 800% of rise in cyber security crimes with this as a ciso and as a member of the ci club as a vice president of the ci club we held a lot of conferences on budgets itself and we could see that the management and the board is was now ready to up the scale of the budget usually it was around 10 to 15% but now my budget for cyber security for 63 Moons has gone up to 30 to 35 percent. Security is an integral part. With the number of incidents which are growing and getting reported, we now feel the scare. It's 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 a business of uh, uh, threat intelligence. Uh, how scared you are? How vulnerable you are? Anything that is digitally connected, we say, will be touched or hacked upon. It's just when is the time that you see. So budgets are increasing. I don't know what he said. I think, I think it's all becoming all the more easier with Gen AI. You can ask that to write code for you to hack. So uh, it's, it's it's absolutely. Now, see, you have worked with uh, countries like your partners, uh, you know, Israel and other governments. Want to know more from you on that? You know, your uh, your take and your work experience. Yeah. So we we through Vipro Ventures, we've been involved with a lot of. Uh, collaborations with uh, startups in different parts of the world, particularly Israel and uh, the U.S., uh, and, and, and primarily on cybersecurity. We've done quite a lot of investments in uh, cyber startups, and, and, and over the last since 2017, we've been doing that. And uh, if you look at the uh, ecosystem that they have developed there, uh, obviously, I would take a step back, look at you know national cybersecurity policies. Right. It is. Uh, it starts from uh, the ability for you to create capacity within the country. It has to start with uh, good um, education that's provided, um, uh, you know, in cyber security at the graduate and uh, level, so that you're producing people who, who have the capability to sort of uh, intervene in, in, for example, creating uh, new technology and stuff like that. And I think that's happening very well in Israel. Um, all of the universities, uh, and then obviously their conscription model that they have with the, the 8200 unit and other things that uh, uh, add or down, it really creates value. So what we've seen as a as a pattern is the ability to sort of take on um, deep tech problems in cyber at a very um, early stage, uh, and uh, uh, obviously taking it to the globe is a, is is, is a uh, is a marketing challenge. It's a much more broader marketing challenge that they have to deal with. So we've, we've helped a lot of Israeli companies do that. As part of the venture investments that we've done in the past, uh, I think the opportunity is tremendous for India. I think uh, cyber is such a space that uh, uh, even the government can be a big consumer of what can be produced here because there's so much uh, of threats that we face across uh, different directions. Uh, and so the opportunity for us to create more deep tech cyber startups here uh, that can cater to both industry here as well as government uh, is phenomenal. I mean, cutting across. I mean, with AI emerging now, there's is even more bigger potential. I think uh, that's okay. Want to uh, say anything on the opportunity for India in this space? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, around a uh, year and a half back, when we thought about starting a cyber security venture, uh, the first country that came to our mind was Israel. We did uh, a lot of research. Uh, we did it uh, very core partnership, and uh, we did a government level tie up so that uh, we could get the best of products. Uh, In the best of prizes in India, and we have here Daniel Keshet from Israel. He works with us now. He joins us from the Israel Prime Minister's office in, from Cyber Security, and he's full time with us now. And uh, the uniqueness that they have, I had asked Daniel a long time back, what makes Israel uh, make this security software is the best. Yeah, then he told me the entire process of how the. Uh, Uh, the way everyone goes gets into the army, they have a one month of aptitude test that they have, and then the best minds who have an aptitude for cyber security get into the, those divisions for the next two years, training on the best tools that the world has seen. And after two years, most of them come out of the army and start up their own startup. And with this uh, best training that they get in the compulsory army uh, uh, appointment that they have, they come out as the uh, Best solution providers, and we are working very closely with them. All right, we will take some questions from the audience. Anybody wants to, uh, you know, ask something from Nihir or Josie on cyber security? Yeah, please. 
globe. So uh, this is Pankaj from Blanc. So we are building a, a savings app and uh, I'm leading tech there. So one of the problem uh, uh, which I see is that we are integrating with a lot of third parties. So my essential question is ki when in your system a lot of third parties are involved, how do I think about the security? Because there are a lot of other dimensions attached to it. So what was the last part? How do you think about? Security. Like uh, security of the system as a whole because there are a lot of third parties, moving parts, sometimes things break from there. And so how do I think? Uh, maybe not to uh, improve security as a whole, but an, at least increase the resilience like I am able to back up my system. So how do I think about it? Very specific question uh, here. Uh, I guess particularly when it comes to mobile apps and uh, cloud connections, uh, which is probably what you are dealing with, it's, a, it's the usual cycle. I mean, if you, you have to go back to the basics around uh, the confidentiality, integrity, and uh, triad, right? And uh, it goes back to the fundamentals. How do you how do you carry out uh, after the first thing starts with you have to have a threat model in place. I, I hope you've done that. If you, and I, I think the threat modeling exercise would give you a lot of perspective around uh, what are the risks that you have to deal with on the application side. Uh, and usually, the, the suspects that you run, run into is how how well can you do, do the authentication, the authorization, uh, the, the encryption of data, key management inside of these systems, all the stuff. That are there. And then, of course, the API security is another one where if you're dealing with third-party applications and uh, servers, services, and how do you manage the keys around that uh, security and stuff like that. Uh, there's a ton of patterns that are available. To, I mean, it's, it's now pretty uh, standardized in terms of how you go through that. There are a ton of patterns that are available in terms of how you can uh, approach those. Uh, we can take, take it offline. Or uh, you could do this, or you can simply use our SDK that we provide called MAPS, Mobile Application Security SDK. You plant it into that and we take care of security. I think one stop solution that would be. <laughs> All right. So we are wrapping up here. Yeah. So can we have a please? Yes. Thank you so much for coming and joining our panel.